in the really big class for violinists on June 25th. And our guest today is Peter Zazowski. He is with us from the Berkshires in Massachusetts. And we have a very decadent few hours of violin music today. We have some corn gold and some izai, a little break where we'll move into Bach for, for a bit, and then we'll return uh, to what I now know to say as conius, not conus. Um, some really great stuff, Le lesser known music than some of the weeks that we've had when we've had Mozart and Beethoven and Brahms and, and all that. So it's very exciting to be here. Um, you can read about Peter Zazowski online. You can listen to his many incredible recordings. I recently went on a whole Chrysler kick on YouTube, which is absolutely amazing stuff to listen to. He uh, has played with so many of the greatest orchestras and conductors. First violinist of the Muir Quartet, teaches at Boston University and, and New England Conservatory. Is that right? Prep. Prep School of New England Conservatory. I first uh, heard him play when I was really quite young, and it was one of the first string quartet concerts I think I ever went to. The Muir Quartet came to Utah quite frequently, and I had the chance to hear them there. Then, as a student at the Taos School of Music, I got to work with the Muir Quartet, and I'll never forget sitting in the concert hall in Taos on a very hot desert summer evening, listening to you play Schubert's Death and the Maiden and being glued to the edge of my seat for from the first minute of the, of the last movement to the last note. It was just the most exhilarating performance I think I'd ever heard of that piece and maybe of any piece. And then once I was in a string quartet, I had the chance to work with Peter at a wonderful uh, chamber music program in Park City, Utah. And there again, I heard one of those performances of a lifetime that you just will never forget of Opus 131. And it was a quartet that my, my group had just learned and performed and I had, hadn't had the chance to hear another group play it since playing it myself. And that same feeling, edge of the seat, um, just from the first second to the end. And that's just an amazing quality about your playing that I, that I, that I remember and well, inspired it, me. Yeah, that's, um, you know, I never know when you go on stage, you never know who's going to be in the audience. It might be, uh, it might be somebody like Cecily Ward who's going to go on and play quartets and teach it at, at the highest level. So uh, it's yeah. a little scary to think that way. Boy, we, when we're on stage, we just, we play and we don't know who's out there. It might be well, somebody. I, what I hope that we'll get today and, and from, the videos that I've seen already, I know we will, is the feeling of just hanging it all out there. That you just you just go and you you do your your thing and play. So I think that's enough talking from me. Let's get into the Corngold Violin Concerto, a piece that is amazing and cool, and I can't wait to hear it. So this is uh, Helena. She's in Manchester, and this is her video.
reactions. Very good. Very good. Okay. So. Okay, I think we have a problem with your microphone, Helena, which we checked in advance. So you're getting a lot of static when you're unmuted. Peter, you're fine. And I'll unmute Helena again. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. I think I had a I had a fan on, so I think it was just ah. the sound. Okay, great. All right, so problem. Okay, so uh, I hope I can see everyone. And everyone can be unmuted, I guess. Uh, uh, Helena, it's beautiful playing. I um, I want to say, first of all, that I have not spent the time on this piece that you have. <laughs> Needless to say. And this piece was a, not a part of the repertoire that I was hearing when I was a student. Of course, that's when the dinosaurs roamed the, roamed the earth. But back in the days when I was a student, Hornbold was not uh, not played, not respected. And can everyone hear me? Yeah, can me. You can hear me very well. I don't know about the others, but uh, I hope they can. And I want to ask you, since I'm not going to be giving you a much technical advice, but I'd like to ask what you know about the creation of this concerto. Um, I know that Corn Gold, um, this concerto was the first kind of piece of um, music that wasn't film music that Corn Gold wrote. Um, I think, didn't he, he, I think he lived in Austria and then at the time of the war he had to, um, get out of Dutch, as we say in States. Yeah, and his only um, way out was if he carried on writing film music, so I think he wrote a lot of film music and then, and then wrote this afterwards or something? Yes. Well, yes, I mean, he, this was cobbled together from movie scores. Okay, so um, I once had a student who did a dissertation on uh, a doctoral dissertation on, on this concerto and she showed uh, clips from movies. Uh, where you could hear, oh, there's a motive that we recognize in the concerto. Now, there was and still exists a great prejudice against uh, film composers. Um, you know, if you're, a, if you're writing for film, you're not a serious composer, right? There's a prejudice against composers who write for film, and uh, that naturally he did suffer from that. You know that uh, Korngold was an incredible child prodigy, you know, one of the most incredible geniuses as an eight or nine year old boy writing, playing, writing, and the language that he wrote, that he uh, grew up in was akin to Strauss, right? So it's late. It, it's it's music that is full of um, uh, shall we say harmonic ambiguity. Yeah. Right? When you play that, Helena, you feel that because you don't know where you are harmonically. What key am I in? Let I don't know. I didn't practice that scale, right? Which makes it incredibly hard to play in tune. And whenever I have a student playing this piece, or if I'm going to try to practice it for a lesson. I have to practice very, very slowly because at gut level, I need to understand where I am harmonically. Now, yeah. you've already done a lot of that work, but I can tell you, and you know already, that this requires maintenance, that you need to do this. Virtually every time you pick up the violin and you're going to play this concerto, you need to, oh, okay, what what key am I in? Where am I going? Is that a, is that a leading tone to... E minor or, or what is that? You see? Yeah. That said, uh, you then have the rhythmic aspect of it, you see? And right away when you start, um, you have this. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, you know, that's 
the, the expectation, of course, is right. Now, uh, it's ironic that a composer whose existence was uh, fit tied to film music in in later years he's become a victim of st of uh, of uh, the movies himself. In posthumously, this sounds like uh, uh, it's not Star Wars, uh, Star Trek. <laughs> It's, it's Star it's Star Trek. I don't know if you ever realized that, but you, you, if you ever go on Google and look for the theme to Star Trek, Star Trek, the original Star Trek, you you hear somebody who has stolen, uh, pretty much stolen music from uh, from Mr. Corngold, you know, but uh, but his music had originality and uh, incredible craft. And uh, for those who say, oh, it's too bad he didn't write more film music, more more concert music. Well, I, I look at the other way and I say that he benefited from, you know, having make, being able to make a living because no matter, no matter what kind of genius you are, <laughs> in the times that he lived in, it was uh, just, a, just a, a, to stay alive by, by creating music was already a great, uh, a great gift to him. Hollywood was a great gift to him, and he was a great gift to Hollywood. He was not not by no means the only great film composer at the time, but he was one of the greats at that time. And who was who was in in Hollywood? Well, there was Arnold Schoenberg, you know, and others. There was a violinist named Heifetz, <laughs> and Heifetz took a shine to to his music, and so this music was, as you know, written for for Heifetz. Now, it's, I didn't know that you were uh, playing this piece today, but I, I was reading just yesterday in one of those strange coincidences, a book by a great, about a great musician by the name of Richard Bergen, uh, who was concertmaster in Boston for 40 years from 1920 to 1962. And because of the incredible uh, period of time when he was there in Boston and in, in Tanglewood, which is where I am now, um, he he worked with many, you know, incredible geniuses, composers, and he was like an older brother to Mr. Heifetz. So, so for example, when when Prokofiev, who was a classmate of Bergen, uh, said, "Listen, I want you to play my first, uh, the the second G minor violin concerto. I'll give you the first American performance." And Bergen said, "No, no, no, no. I I want to give it to Heifetz because he will make it famous." Uh, okay. Okay. Have you ever heard Heifetz's recording of the Prokofiev yeah, G minor? It's amazing. Yeah. With the symphony, you know. And my father, who was in the orchestra, took pictures of Heifetz in the record, not not during his playing, but in the recording studio with Charles Munch. So here's a little story, and I, I'm sorry to be so didactic with you, but here is a story about Heifetz being a little bit, um, uh, shall we say, insecure, because Mr. Bergen, uh, his great friend Richard Bergen. And his his wife uh, Ruth, they had him over at dinner, and they said, "Have you heard this fellow Oistra?" And uh, Heifetz said, uh, uh, "You know, what do you think of him?" And Heifetz said, "Oh, I, I don't know. I don't think he's good, or I don't like his playing, right?" And since they got him going, uh, he said to them, "And I don't like all these contemporary concertos. I suppose you like Bartok and Pinemith and Berg." And uh, Bergen said, yes, very much. I played them all. He said, well, I'm going to send you copies, my my music, because I don't think any of them is worth 10 cents. You, you wait until you hear the modern composer I'm going to broadcast. Of course, it was Korngold. <laughs> Heifetz, who was the, the, the incredible, most incredible violinist of, of that age and maybe any, he he didn't have the, the greatest sense of what is great music of the t of his time. So he 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 played Korngold and Nicholas Rocha and uh, Castelnuovo Tedesco and some of the composers who settled in Hollywood, but didn't think much of Bartok, Hindemith, and Berg. Not that it matters, but it's just so funny because I was reading this just yesterday, and here you are playing this concerto. Now, as you uh, have have mastered so many aspects of it, I want to ask you to exaggerate some aspects of it. First of all, that wonderful G sharp, right? 
and even the rhythm you see if you start right now and we have to understand the rhythm da 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 di which means the eighth note and dotted quarters need to be exaggerated a little bit why don't yeah. you try <laughs> Maybe you might have to stand back just a little bit for sound. But that first note, that first impression, Elena. Right? It's not just... They, it's not good enough to just play... But to rather start... Okay? Remember, there's no introduction to this. Yeah. So the first note is the first note of the concerto. It's not... It's not uh, following any kind of a duty. Mm, okay. Let's vibrate before the first note. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, so that first note, I want a fast and narrow vibrato. How are you going to make that vibrato more narrow? Um... Is it supposed to be the hand being closer and... It, what I recommend is to bring your wrist up. Okay. The wrist is like this. It's narrow. When it's, when it's straight like this, it becomes... From the, the finger, right? Yep, yes, yes. Okay. But in order to get the, the narrow range of the vibrato, I would bring your wrist up a little bit. That's it. That'll work. Right, so you don't have much time, do you? It's just an eighth note. Right, and what's interesting? is the the, the, re, the the number of beats, right? So you never get settled, right? You always feel that, oh, wait a minute, is it in two fours and three fours and four four? What is it? Right? Mm. So let's make it clear. One, two, three, one. So there's a four four there, yeah? Yeah, the second bar is a four four, exactly. yeah. Oh. So that G sharp, well, thank goodness he wrote a four four. Why you? Why did he write a four four? Do you think? Um, so I've got longer to be expressive, I guess, on the. Yeah, G sure. I mean, it because it's that tritone, right? Mm. Quite correctly, I, I figured out uh, that it'd be better to have a, an extra, a little bit of extra time on that, but still within within a meter. In other words, no fermata, but within yeah. a meter, it turned out to be four four which means that you need to vibrate into the third beat. Okay. Yes, that's lovely. Now, uh, I want to ask you, when you finally get the octave, Why not play it in the E string? Oh, it's scary. <laughs> oh, you know, you're really a good violinist. You're very good. I watched you play. I listened to you play. I said, she's a beautiful player. I, I like watching you play and listening. You have no fear of that G. Okay. You might even miss the A string. And even if you make it, it's antiseptic. Yeah, yeah. The only antiseptic thing I want in my house is sanitizer. <laughs> <laughs> so why don't you play, you know, some 16s before that? Okay. Um, so just play from where you stopped, if you like, you know? Go ahead. <laughs> Now listen, Helena, 
The first time, it was... So that's a, a, a dominant. And this one... So this can be relaxed and released because you're going to a tonic, right? Yeah. Right. So yeah. go ahead and play that. Okay. Yes, yes. So I would smile and say, yes, I'm in D major. Because when I'm here, I don't know that I'm in D major. I don't know, but... Yes. So I'm, I'm going to smile and everybody's going to feel happy because they've arrived at D major at home. So do that again and let's go on. Go ahead. Okay, so listen, what you're going to need more is more variety of texture with the bow. So some closer to the fingerboard. Not always, because how many F sharps do I have to hear? <laughs> If you play those four in a row, well, I'm going to throw a tomato at you. A virtual <laughs> tomato. Okay. No, don't do that. Give me some variety. There should be four different kinds of F sharp. Okay, okay. Give me variety or give me death. <laughs> Yes, yes. Your teachers are asking you to play here sometimes. We want to have all kinds of sounds, all kinds of vibrato, all kinds of sounding point, right? So when you start to... Now, what is this? this how would you describe this music? Basically, what do you have? One, two, three, four, five notes. Four or five notes, that's all. So it challenges you as an artist. You see, because, because you start from here. Are you starting up bow or down? Uh, down bow, I think. Yeah. All right, go ahead. So, and think about the rhythm. One, two. Maybe this is the most. So it's interesting because the notes are not very interesting. <laughs> yeah. Okay. F sharp to G, right? Of course. You know, that's going for it, right? There's a, there's one hand clapping in the in the in the audience there because that gives you a sense of going for it, right? Yeah. Okay, so do it once more to convince yourself because you're absolutely a wonderful violinist to do that is nothing for you. Uh straight on it or no no just do that and go on.
So let's just check the rhythm there at the end. Yeah. Okay. How many beats is that before on the uh, C sharp before you get back to D? Um, four. But that's a rhythm as well. Did yeah. I too much? So what do you think you have to do? You have to save the bow a little more at the tip, right? Right. Otherwise, you're not going to get the right number of beats. And you're going to have an unhappy conductor. Was it too short? I believe so. Okay. Which are because of the written noodle. Ah, uh, okay. All right. So maybe about three bars before it. Okay. All right. Let's go a little farther. Okay, so, so this is what I want to ask you in this place, Elena. Can you dance with your bow? rhythm, and you sounded a little bit like um, you were in school when you did that. Okay. <laughs> um. <laughs> because of the distortion. Ah, okay. Hard. Because I know you sound 100% better in live. If you were in this room, you would sound, it would sound better. But I want to encourage you to to feel the tie. You know, the... Do you want me to step back? Is it the sound? Or... Maybe it'll help a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Um... Right, but even this. I would encourage you to move a little bit so you feel D, pa pa, pa pa, pa pa, pa ya da da. Mm. So it's more fun. What I think I want to ask you to do is when you play this, this 16th, uh, the passages, can you try more high fetzi in spiccato? Well, and his that. spiccato, which we can't even imagine, his, his grip, you know, was something like crazy, like he was quite pronated. And as a result, his spiccato was, was much more down here. You can see mm -hmm. recordings of him playing there. Uh, don't, I wouldn't recommend trying to do what he did in terms of how he did it. But the idea is that however you hold the bow, this uh, has to be very biting. Mm -hmm. okay. Very, very, very short. The contrast with the... Uh, so the contrast with the trills. Okay. Right, right. Yeah. Well, it's it's hard to uh, it is hard to say because of the distortion of the sound. I don't know quite why. Like. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, anyway, and then there's always the intonation. You have to do it very slowly, very carefully. It's you know, 
Yeah, it's so easy to make it an octave jump instead of a yeah. step and high. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's uh, that's his language, you see. Now, let's jump up ahead a little bit to the next passage, because I want to hear you play the melody, the, you know, the, the, the big tune. Yeah, shall I go from the tune? Yes. Yes. These are very big intervals, Helena. So we need to feel the, the, the large intervals because he didn't do he did the same thing. And I want to feel the yearning, uh, the, uh, the peculiarity of such big intervals, you see? And I felt like you just played them. You didn't feel them somehow. So look at that. That's amazing. Right? Goes up, comes back. Go ahead. Oh. Take your time. Take your time. It's all right. Okay. Now, what would happen if you, when you're going to the frog, instead of doing the standard crescendo, why don't you make a diminuendo? So, in other words... Because you would not sing the da da. You wouldn't sing that. The only reason you did that is because you've got a bow in your hand. So try to imitate a singer. Oh, what a wonderful singer I am. Okay? So, Helena, I see, I see and feel that your stomach is contracting when you come down you do and then you contract yeah i find it really hard to i think shifting up is my, my shifting up instead of my shifting down for sure now we've identified this, an area that you will improve on that will make this so much more effective so ask yourself you've got a lifetime to play ask yourself why is it that I tighten up on the on the way down. Okay. Why? What is it that makes you want to tighten up? And is it only up bow or down bow as well? It could be to do with the bowing, but also I think I'm just not planning. Yeah, so let me ask you to think about a body part. Right here. Oh, uh, yeah. Skip down. I want you to think of what you're doing. Now, when I make that shift down, here I am, I'm right up against there. Now, when I come down, my thumb is going to travel back. Okay? Okay. Experiment. Right, right, let's do that again. And don't stop vibrating on the G sharp. Keep vibrating the whole note. solve this because it's a not a serious problem you you don't have a big serious problem just a little tightness in your in your in your stomach because you you're worried right so to, without even the note until you feel very nice and flowy with your back muscles which you don't think about behind your shoulder there's those big buck back muscles that you have so Back and forth and no tension. Not too much. Okay, so your your setup is so good. I shouldn't talk about your setup. And what I like to do is I like to start with my wrist. So I'm leading I'm there's a puppeteer up there. And the the uh, string is attached not to my elbow but to my wrist. Body and the wrist comes first and the elbow follows. Okay. Go ahead and try. Open strings again. 
No, the real night, the real notes. Good. Okay, you're fine. And you can go on and play the tune because I think she's going to stop me pretty soon. <laughs> I am. I'm so sorry. Okay. That's fine. Let's let's continue it a little bit more. Okay. challenge that I told you the first page. He has many, many notes that kind of swirl around and keep going back to one note, which makes it a challenge for, for us as artists how to make the variety of this melody with a combination of sounding point, bow speed, how to figure out when to be a faster bow, when a slower bow, right? So think of your tools with a bow, speed, pressure, sounding point. You, have, you need to think about how to, how to apply these, these factors plus variety of vibrato from no vibrato to expressive vibrato to what I call incidental vibrato. What's incidental vibrato? That's my language. Incidental vibrato is the vibrato that, you, that you're doing when nobody notices it. Ah, uh, okay. So like minimal vibrato. Or... Like a middle vibrato that you don't notice. Okay. And you need that vibrato because then when you have an expressive note, it's much more vibrated than the incidental note. But it's not a good thing, generally speaking, it's not great to go from no vibrato to expressive vibrato. Because it sounds that it starts to sound very artificial. I'm making generalities here. You know, it, it, uh, it's not as good as there's your expressive vibrato. If I did that, there's an expressive vibrato, then an incidental, and then expressive. So anyway, when you have this whole passage, you had so many F sharps. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a real challenge, okay? Because he, he's got uh, too many times notes are repeating in, in these patterns, and you need to find a way to make it all hold together in an artistic way. It's harder than the, the actual passage work, right? Have you studied the whole piece, Helena? Yeah, I've just started the last movement and I'm kind of wishing that I'd started it sooner. But ah, yeah. I've done well, the other one, the second movement. Yeah. Well, yeah, so I, I, I obviously I'm very pleased to hear you playing this and you're gonna you know, have a wonderful summer with it. And are you still seeing your professor during these, mo these months? Yeah, we're having lessons on um, on WhatsApp actually. <laughs> WhatsApp. Oh, WhatsApp. Yes, you use yeah. WhatsApp. Excellent. Okay. Well, I, I I don't believe I've ever met him, but I he, of course I know him to be a very famous, a great and famous teacher. Uh, so you're in very good hands, and uh -huh. I'm glad to hear you today. And thank you for playing. Thank you for your help. Thank you so much. Okay. I can't wait to hear you in person in Manchester someday. <laughs> yeah. Do you know by any chance Jan Repko? No, he's a teacher in London, right? Yeah, but I thought he was also in in Royal Northern. I don't know, but anyway, I, I he's a he's from South Africa, but I knew him for many many years. And at one point, I went to visit him in Manchester area because I was teaching at Cheatham's. Oh, uh, okay. And 
was teaching there, and I thought also Royal Northern, but maybe not, maybe not anymore. Anyway, bravo to you. Thank you. Okay. So shall we so say- I'm next? so sorry we have to move on, but we have such great stuff to come that we, we yeah. need to, to yeah. move forward to some Izai. Yes. Uh, those of you who have watched these classes would have heard the first moment of the second Izai Sonata a few weeks ago with Alec, and now we have the Melancholia and Danse des Ombres with Harry. Harry. Um, and we'll go to the video. Yep, let's go to the videotape.
All right, bravo, Harry. Good, very good. Um, then the next time you uh, have you go back to London and, and you resume in-person lessons, you happen to run into uh, Muriel. Uh, she will laugh because I, I have taught her this piece. <laughs> <I'm right. laughs> and she, uh, she knows how, how crazy I am. Okay. Uh, I, I am. I'm somewhat notorious with some ideas. But before okay. we get started with that, do you have your music handy? Yes, I do. I want to make sure you know that you're playing a couple of wrong notes and we should fix them right, right off the bat. Okay. Okay? Yeah. Uh, do you have the Henley edition? Um, with, with bar numbers? No, I've got it. I mean, no, I don't. I've just got, um, it's, a, it's a Belgian edition, I think. Okay, does it have bar numbers, measure numbers? Um, no. Okay, well, so I'll just have to play for you to make sure because I don't know if those were accidental wrong notes or whether you learned them wrong. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. The first one is... Uh, variation four. Yeah. F sharp. Right. Okay. Was that one time only? Um, no, I've, no, I've learned that. No, I learned that. I saw the F natural at the end of the bar. So, right. obviously, right. so let's get rid of that one right away. Yeah. Then F natural. Right. Yeah. Okay. So. I'm, I'm glad to fix the things that are not negotiable. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, now the next variation, the second line. Uh, still a G sharp, Harry. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right, so we've got those out of the way, right? Uh, go ahead and play variation five, just for about, just about a, two, two lines. I just want to make sure you hear it right. So now that we have those notes correct and the other one, now we'll talk about things that are just my opinion, okay? Now, uh, Balanconia, I would like you to experiment with a, well, a more somber tempo. Okay. okay. Yeah. It, it, on the recording, it felt a bit, a bit uh, anxious. <laughs> yeah, okay. So let's try... A little bit slower, and still in a in a obviously clear te tempo, but not quite as 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 quick as you did it. Okay. Right. Still in six or two? Do you think? I would do it in six. Okay. Which note deserves more vibrato, the A or the E? Um, if you don't know, play. Let's play it. I think the A. I agree. So um, that means that the E at the end of the bar should be less vibra vibrato. Yeah. So that's clear. I mean, you don't have to make a very big deal about the A because, you know, he didn't put a hairpin or anything. But if you sing it, it has a kind of an intensity, you know, as you did. And then the, the E can, because it's on the G string as opposed to the D, which automatically makes it more intense, you don't need a vibrato, really. Okay. So go ahead. Yeah. 
play with a little bit more between the G. Uh, you can have a little bit more space, okay? And then you have... Your hands are large. You don't have to cut off. <laughs> right, so... It's kind of a lazy swing, okay? So... kind of a rocking, gentle and sad at the same time. that you change that bowing. Okay. I don't see the need to change the bow there. It seems like you could just play, just... Let's keep the same, the same uh, bow, okay? Yeah. All right, now I want to talk to you something about the next measure. Because okay. we have this. You have a D all by itself. Yeah. Unfortunately, because it's all by itself without a double stop, since you are free of the double stop, you vibrate. You went to... <laughs> Which you would never sing. Never yeah. sing that way. Yeah. It would be silly. Dee da da. <laughs> right? You would never do that. Yeah. So... Okay. So let's uh, let's see you play that. I'm gonna move the I'm gonna move this table for a moment so I can. Play. Will I play or not yet? Yes, just one second. I'm I'm uh, needing to plug my computer a little bit. Here it is, so that it doesn't run out of battery. Okay, this is a problem averted. There it is. Okay. There we go. Okay, yeah, so try that again now. That's much better. Yeah, more of a this, line. Yeah. Huh? More of a line rather than like a better no. line because otherwise that for that for bad vibrato on the D would be <laughs> would be a problem, right? So then. that the there's a sede you see the sede there yeah. it i need that sede to be felt it felt like oh it it felt to me when you played it that you saw that on the page and you said oh i see a sede so i'm going to slow down okay <laughs> 
but we need a lot more uh, more musical value than that. See, so I'm going to ask you to feel the pain. Feel well, pain. Maybe not. Maybe not pain. Sorrow. Feel that sorrow. <laughs> Notice I'm not talking to you about how much retard to make. I'm just asking the character of it should be that you are sorrowful and you're tired. Okay? Where should I go from? Just well, bar seven. The the um yeah. go from there. Okay, the Boeing is controlling your musicality yeah. in a way that I don't think you're aware. So take a look, be beware of those single notes. First of all, Harry, you can you can hold the note. You don't have to stop. Okay. You see, why does this happen? Because you're going to the frog, of course. <laughs> That's not good. You would never sing like that. So, so what am I gonna do? I'm gonna go away from the frog, from the from the bridge, yeah. and go, and hardly vibrate, just incidental. So, go ahead from there, from the tenth. Um, where's sorry, where's that? Oh, sorry. Nice. Hold on, hold on. Don't lift the third finger. Keep it. Nice. How about another fingering? Instead of this... Instead of that shift, which is pretty awkward, yeah. how about this? And then one one on the on the F yeah. sharp, the F yes. sharp, the D sharp. So we're gonna try to to then you should. Uh, and then I might go back to one. One, one. Okay? okay. And then I'm going to ask you to try another fingering, not what's in the part, but this. First of all, when you have this, this F sharp should be a little louder. Now, don't shift. Until here. You see? Yeah, okay. So just... Stay so, uh, stay. Try it. You understand it? Yeah. Stay up there as well. No, that's exactly right. What you did. I want you to think about the hierarchy of vibrato. Okay. <laughs> so this note should be more than this. Agree or disagree? You don't agree. have to agree with me, by the way. No, I agree. <laughs> you did this. They were equal. If you sang it, Harry, da yeah. da -da -da. Yeah. you wouldn't. <laughs> but the trouble is, you get a violin in your hand and you're such, you're such a very good violinist, but you got to connect to the emotional character of this music. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's, it's good for you to sing it. I'm not gonna ask you to sing now. <laughs> I know there are, 
there are two students in the world, one who will sing when you ask them to, and the other who would rather die, <laughs> right? And for the ones who, will, who would rather die than sing in a lesson, they have yeah. to listen to me sing, and that is a very sad thing indeed. I'm sure it's But the bigger point of that is, you can't just play with both, both notes with vibrato because you can. But you yeah. need to think of the hierarchy of the phrase and the emotional um, connection of the music. Because this is your, your duty, is to connect emotionally to the music more effectively. And that's why I'm so glad to hear you today, because I can tell you several things that will help you do that. One of them is to control the long phrase with how much vibrato, right? Yeah. I mean, this is beautiful. And you did it very well. And this is with regret. And, and you see, it's nice to stay there because the same character. Yeah, I like that, yeah. You may see in the party, you say, well, that is Isai's fingering. Have you had a conversation with your teacher about this? No, not really, no. All right. The, some of the fingerings that you have in the part, they may be his eyes fingering. I think I have his eyes part. I think that's what it, it says on yeah. the front cover of the thing. Right. But what I'm going to say to you, and this is where I am controversial, you do not have to do his eyes fingerings. Okay. Yeah. And I mean, I've listened to, I've listened to a few recordings where that's why I didn't hold the third, because the third, because with the harmonic, because I'd heard some recordings which didn't. Yeah. Right. Uh, so, Let's, let's ask ourselves, what's going on here? So you're not hearing Isai's piece. You're hearing somebody's interpretation of Isai's piece. Exactly, yeah. And that person can be great. It can be a genius. Uh, you know, it could be, you know, Heifetz didn't play these, but it could be Asha Heifetz. It's still wrong. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? And it's not as if this is difficult for you. There's no problem for you to... Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and beside, it's really richer when you have the double stop. Yeah, okay? yeah. So I would encourage you in this case to play what he wrote. <laughs> okay, that's good. Okay? Yeah. So let's go to from here. So this one, I, I mean, if you could reach it, <laughs> but he wrote he doesn't want you to. <laughs> right? Sorry to bother you, but you have habits. <laughs> I gotta make you aware of them. Yeah. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> right? So this eighth, this A should be the the less vibrated one. You see? This no vibrato. Now And then you played very well. And you felt the uncertainty of that. That's great. Okay, so play the play the E again with it. Be careful. Look, this rhythm is, is related to a Sicilian. Yes. Um... Exactly. And that's, so, why, that's why I, just going back to the tempo, I played it a bit quicker because I thought, because I played the G minor sonata. Yes. My teacher said, you know, make it more of a dance. And we thought poco lento meant not so slowly. Right. I, this is controversial. This is only my opinion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that was, that yeah. I did not feel melancholia. I felt a little bit too anxious. Yeah, you yeah. See? No, I agree. Well, it's not a question of how fast or slow, yeah. really. But I want to feel the sadness. Da, da, di, di. Because it's romantic era version of a Sicilian, yes, yeah. right? And you know, the lure is also related to that rhythm. In any case, in no interpretation of this, are you allowed to do dee da da, just as you're not allowed to do. <laughs> right? I usually kick my students when they do, do that. <laughs> I literally <laughs> kick, <laughs> right? So whatever your tempo you decide on, Harry. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to have an overwhelming sense of loss. Okay. okay. 
So I want to go through this and get a little bit in the pizzicato because uh, I, I, I see somebody's going to warn me pretty soon. Yeah. Okay. So let's do from uh, from here and press on the F sharp, right? One, stay there, and then go ahead. You know, this what I'm telling you is going to take some time. Okay. Yeah. I prefer to be here. And and if you're down bow, then just stay there. So it's improv. You didn't sound improv. You sounded very. Doesn't sound yeah. athletic. All right. So, so I would think about more at libitum. More, and you can slow down, it's just more sound though, yes? And long. Now, let's talk a little bit about the pizzicato. Yeah. Here's the problem with all this pizzicato is that you have open strings, rings, yep. rings, doesn't ring, doesn't ring. There's a problem. Yeah. Mm. So, I don't know if you can see me because I had to change my position and I have to see if the light is better. Okay. Maybe that'll help some. Yeah, okay. Now look at what I'm doing, Harry. Vibrato, the vibrato. The How is that possible? Are you going? Are you going towards the the violin as you pizzicato, or is that just the angle? Yeah, I'm doing something else. Listen, this is what you did. Now look at me. It's fingernail. Oh. I play right. with my fingernail. <laughs> what you, get what more resonance. What was if you've got none, or do you need to make sure you do? You better start growing one, like yeah. my beard. I started growing it a few days ago. You need a fingernail, yeah. actually two of them, because yeah. with a fingernail, all you have to do is roll your wrist forward, roll your wrist forward, not the elbow, keep the elbow there, other way, exactly the other way. Can you see my wrist? Exactly. Oh, to like get that. Yes. Rolling this way. Absolutely <laughs> weak when you have a finger fingernail. <laughs> Sounds like more like a guitar then. Yeah. Yes. Now, look at my right hand and left hand pizzicato. Now, you played this mezzo forte. It says piano. Oh, yeah. Why do you do that? Because it's easy for you, <laughs> you see? <Yeah. laughs> but less, 
Whisper. Now. Yes, ring with a fingernail. Pizzicato with vibrato. Now, this is the activity of somebody who has too much time on his hands. <laughs> we all have too much time on my hands, but I've been teaching this. I can't say it's, it's not a recent development. Yeah. I was bugged. I was annoyed that I couldn't get a decent resonance on the top notes, knowing that yeah. Isai loved vibration. Yeah, it's especially the second chord because you just, it just, it just kind of dies because the first one's kind of like it resonates because you yes. know, but that one, it doesn't work. Yeah. Okay. See? Right. The other thing is so much like it's always this. Always this. Who needs that? Look, you will see left hand, right hand pizzicato. It gives a, a dance like to it. Even It's a grave dance, like a pavan. Yeah. Right now. Pizzicato with a pinky, with a frog, with a thumb. Now. Vibrate, less mezzo, forte, and roll, and left, it's a thumb, two fingers. So we got this, and this, two fingers. I want this finger for the B, dedicated to the B, and this finger only for the two, bottom two. You see? Okay. So there's a, a lot that goes on. I mean, I don't have enough time to tell you, but there's so many things that are interesting. And the most important thing that I've got to say to you, uh, such a, a wonderful violinist as you are, is that my, my least favorite word when I hear somebody play is they executed the piece very well. <laughs> What I mean, what's the, I see pe execute is pejorative. It means you played the notes, they were executed. They weren't expressed or loved. Mm. And that includes the rest, my friend. Mm -hmm. Three. See, for when you, when you played the rest, I felt like you didn't know what to do with the rest. Uh, okay. Right, okay. Oh, okay. What am I doing? I'm connecting to the next. I don't stop, it's a rest, and then I start again. Yeah, that's like the art of playing unaccompanied, isn't it? Kind of yes, giving, it you, is. giving yourself it's time. The art, the art of playing arrests, the art of cre creating a whole unit, you know? And I, I'm so happy for you to playing this magnificent piece. Yep. Um, you know, there's, there's so much to be to love. I, I have to stop now, but I do want to tell you that variation five is an improvisation. Yeah. Improvisation yeah. and therefore should not be played as strictly as you did. You see? Okay. So in other words, it's two people talking. One says the other says It's, it's free, you see, and you have to figure out when to be free and when not to be. Okay. But when you have this, that's, you don't need to be slow on that. Okay. Right? Okay. Yes? Yeah. yeah. Look okay. at this. This beautiful C, B flat, and resolve to E minor. Is it really? A minor. <laughs> okay, back to E minor. So 
it, it's much more free than you're doing right now. Okay. okay. And then the next variation, faster. <laughs> more more virtuosic okay I last thing, i would not necessarily play all down bows this was a tradition that Izai picked up from joachim where everything is down bow you remember joachim's edition of bach g minor fugue <laughs> that was the thing you know that was joachim yeah so i see that as uh, <laughs> that it's all right yeah i think it's just and leave it because <laughs> yeah. okay yeah so well, anyway i i hope you'll try some of these things no, well, thank you so much you're welcome it's a pleasure to hear you thank you so much cheers well cheers love your accent <laughs> <laughs> thank you so I just have to check that we can go over time a little bit. Is that okay with everyone? I hope I'm not in trouble. No, you're not in trouble as long as you don't have to run out of the room. No, no. Okay, great. So let's jump in and, and we're going to leave the world of his eye, but stay in the solo, solo violin realm and have Nico uh, give us some Bach E major partita. Yes.
Thank you. Very good. So you. you go by Nico, Nico? Yes, Nico Swan. And are you in, where are you now? In my house in Chile, in Santiago. In Santiago. Mm -hmm. I have very fond memories many years ago. Nice. Uh, 1982, came and played Brahms Concerto in Santiago. Nice. Uh, actually, Jamie Laredo was sick, and so I substituted for him, and I went and played in Santiago, and uh, the orchestra was very kind to me and very, uh, uh, very nice host. So uh, it was my only time to Chile, but a very fond memory. So anyway, what I want to talk to you is that you have, you are a very artistic fellow. You have very strong ideas musically, and you, you bring them off well. So I, I don't feel... Like trying to impose my opinions about the musical value is uh, not very useful for you because what you're doing many, many good things. Um, and I want to talk to you rather about some, some things that are going on in your body. Okay. Now you move very nicely. All of your motions are from your uh, lower body and it's musical and you move very nicely, but you have tension in your upper body, particularly in your upper back and shoulders. And it was most noticeable in the jig, actually. Okay. Um, and so I'd like to go right to that area, go to the jig. And let's see if we can get more fluidity with your wrist and fingers on the bow. So. When I do this. I want to see you do that. You see, mm -hmm. you look to me. This is what you look like. I'm going to, I don't know if you can see me clearly. I'm going to try to imitate you. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to help you to free your, your arm with a little bit more wrist and fingers moving around so that you can be, be free, basically, mm -hmm. so that you can dance. Because I saw you dancing with your body, but your upper body is a little stiff. Mm -hmm. So let's try that. figure out where your elbow needs to be so that you don't have to do you see this is not a good thing so so for your purposes it's better for you to practice in this area of the bow nearer to the frog okay so See? So let's do from um, from there. Right. Okay. Now, when you start, it can we have a little more bow so that it's more joyful? Because you were like, you were restricted, Nico. You were. So look slowly what I'm going to do with the bow. Very slowly. Off and on. Just do that. Measure and a half. Right. And a little faster. Thank you. 
that's that, that's better. I always say in a master class, whenever uh, I do a class and somebody plays the back the second time, and they play better, uh, I always I, I'm not ready I'm not ready to believe that it's anything I said. It could simply be that you just played it better the second time. <laughs> but it doesn't hurt. It's probably just that now I'm aware of what I'm not doing or I'm right. doing wrong. Right. And when I think of it, it just yeah, you don't have a second. problem. Nicole. You just it's just useful to, to have somebody point it out to you. Just the way I was pointing out to Harry about this silly vibratos on single notes, right? Mm -hmm. After double stop, the, the note after is a d dangerous note for his vibrato. And for you, when you, when he thinks about it, when you think about it, you guys solve it right away. So let's do now the second half of this from the F sharp. And the same thing, give me a little bit more bow speed. Okay, now I want you to repeat this now and let's see what you're gonna do then the second time with dynamics. <laughs> You did a different scheme the second time, and that's what I was looking for. Because after all, you have uh, is it or is it um, uh, the answer is it's both, they're both good, and you should absolutely do different things. But one thing I want to caution you is, beware of doing uh, uh, echoes. Mm -hmm. When Bach wants an echo, he writes an echo. If he doesn't write an echo and you do one, it, it is very likely heard as artificial, right? You know where I was talking about, right? Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> this kind of thing is not good. It's, mm -hmm. not, it's not effective because it sounds very, very uh, mannered, see? So you can do, you can do... Uh, now, no, that's interesting, you know, because F sharp minor, right? Because, mm -hmm. you know, so that can be louder, that can be softer, as long as you're thinking and you're feeling the music, which you do very well, you'll, you'll figure out something. Now, let's see about this. Uh, It's your fingers, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I think you're too quickly off the B. Right, so you see there's a little discomfort in your bow. Right, so... If you prefer, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I did that the second time. Yeah, yeah, so that's fun. Okay, uh, all right. So just I, th I wanted to take care of that so that you're free. Maybe you don't have to be so close to the frog. Okay, mm -hmm. now let's go back and look at the gavotte.
basically, character is very nice. Um, and I like the, the, the friendly kind of joyful dance feeling that you have. Um, now, what about after you finish this? Now, what are you going to do here? So here the bow is going to travel more slowly, right? Slower. So that's the scheme that I like to have. But as long as you don't play, if you don't, as long as you don't play with the same bow speed that you did the beginning, mm -hmm. so do the beginning second time and go on to that first variation. to down bow, you see? Uh, down. <laughs> I would just go back to down bow and, you know, because maybe one time you can do an up bow and that might be. <laughs> Otherwise it can always not be down bow. So just do from here and go on. You did that one? Now let's see. Then go on. So do from the open A. So, I mean, it's a matter of taste. After you do this, I could see this a little softer, a bit more conversational. On. And it would be cool if you go to three here. If you do that, then you're there. You see, because you did something, you shifted there to two, which is a hard one. Mm -hmm. I'd rather shift when I have more time, which means on a quarter. Now I'm there. See, then. So try it once from here. And then go to three. So in terms of the fingering, it's nice, right? Mm -hmm. Now, what about the bowing? Maybe we don't have to be so many backwards notes, bows. Down. Yeah, try that. Yes, Take exactly. Okay, no, that's okay. exactly right. So just down again. And then I'm going to get near the frog and stay near the frog. Right? Sorry. 
you stuck at the tip. You're stuck at the tip. You control your bow. That was a huge subject for my uh, my revered professor Galamian. He was the master of bow distribution. So we have the bow. Here we go. Look at that. Now here I am, and I'm going to crawl to the frog. So that's Galamian, or also predecessors. Go ahead. And then you do this again. Fine. Now we'll just do this. Uh, now. Let's figure out something here. Go ahead from the uh, from here. You're, you're too close to the tip. And that means that when you have three notes slurred, you're in trouble, Nick, Nico, because you're too, you're too far away from the frog. So figure out how you can get, especially before three notes slurs. Okay, go ahead. You try. You try what you like. So let me show you just one one more bow thing, a uh, violin. Uh, sorry, the, the fingering. Because uh, the bowings are pretty pretty straight. I mean, you see sl three notes slurred, right? Now, what I like to do here is on this B, I'm going to put a three. Why is that? Because that allows me to keep that third finger on B and then... And then... So by parking the B, the third finger on that B and not moving, everything will be in position. So try it from slowly from bar 56. Now, now, now if you would keep your third finger, don't pick up your third finger, keep it on B, keep it there. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Now you don't want a glissando, but you see that keeps the position instead of what you did, which is you did very well. And then you shift it, but. It just feels fun to me. <laughs> Right, and then you do all your your fun stuff. <laughs> uh, yeah, and then you got you do good job with the double stops, right? You did all that very well. Uh, so just um, remember that your upper back muscles. And all of this has to be more fluid, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, because you're doing musically, you do very well, and I, I like it very much to listen to you. I just want to keep Thank keep you. your idea of where the bow is. If you're not comfortable, then it might be the angle of your elbow and shoulder, you know. 
but uh, it's it's very nice to hear you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank my you. pleasure. Cool. Okay, my pleasure too. Okay. Bravo, Nico. Sounds great. You play with such joy. It's really wonderful. It does. I love it. He's really, yeah. I'd love to hear the preludio, but there's no time. <laughs> <laughs> no, because now we have to hear this piece that that hardly anyone plays. So Shintaro yeah. is still with us. Yes. Yes, Shintaro, you're still here. Yes. Yeah. So we'll jump into your video of the of the. Is it really Conyus? Like with yes. the Conyus, yeah. Conyus concerto. Yeah, when you, Jules Konyas, un, unknown, except Yasha Heifetz made him famous. Another one. <laughs> yeah, he made him famous. And I think that there were other Russians that played him, you know. I mean, they, uh, you know, they played Kabalevsky and they played Kachaturian, of course. If, if you want to hear something incredible, I, I recently heard a recording of Igor uh, David Oistrakh playing the slow movement of the Kabalevsky concerto. I, I'm telling you, it's the most incredible playing. You you can't believe it. So all of you, I want you to go on your computer, look up David Oistra Kabalevsky, and I'll go to the it. movement. I'll post it to the Facebook group. Yeah, it's something you have to hear. You just have to hear. I, I think you'll probably cry. It's so so incredible. All right, let's get it. Now, now that we've said that, now let's have some <laughs> incredible bonus. <laughs> okay, Shintaro.
Well, that was terrific. I'm, I'm really, you know, it's funny. I, I the second time I've listened because I listened uh, this morning, and I liked it even better this time than I did the first time. Um, you. you know, I, I want to just make a general plea to er, er, all of you. Uh, please do do what what uh, Shintaro is doing, playing a piece that's not well known, playing the socks off of it, as we say, and making a really good case for a piece which. Uh, um, upon further inspection, may not be the Brahms concerto, but it doesn't matter. It's extremely well written, well played, and this is such a a, a, a joy for for an audience, uh, particularly violinists who are so used to hearing the same concertos all the time. So, if you've got an opportunity to learn something like this, or the Busoni concerto, it's one of my favorite uh, guilty pleasures. Um, or some other concertos that are off the beaten track but are worthwhile, uh, you will stand out from a crowd of people. So I'm saying that to you, Nicholas, Harry, and Helena. Uh, please, as a, as a person who spends a lot of time listening to auditions, I am so pleased to hear somebody come and do something like this, especially if it's played that well. Okay, so let's talk about a, a little bit, a few things. First of all, this piece, in a certain sense, reminds me of a prior concerto, which you may or may, or may not have learned. But it starts very much like the um, the Vieton concerto number four, the D minor. Do you know that one? Uh, I've never played it, but... Right. It starts very much like this. It starts with a D. Yeah. It starts off with a restative, like slowly, like that. So when you started, uh... In... nobody can breathe, Shintaro, until you continue. You can do some different fingerings. I might prefer to go the A string there, but the most important thing is to get this sense of um, of uh, suspension because you play. I mean, one thing I particularly like about the about uh, uh, concertos like this is the tooties, right? It is a big tootie before you play, right? And Vietnam, the tootie is incredible. It's like Beethoven, and then you come in. Well, so you come in, and the orchestra stops, and then you enter. It's you are you are what we call a diva or divo, masculine. You come in and you play, and nobody can breathe, you know, because the the audience's ability to breathe and to feel is dependent on you, and your bow and your feeling. You're transmitting your feeling for the music. First comes from the composer into your body. And then by will and quality of your breathing, you transmit this, this beautiful phrase to an audience. There's great drama in a single note. So let's hear this beginning, this recitative of great beauty and sorrow. that I, I feel like I shouldn't stop. I just want to ask you to experiment. You have this. Now change the color. From this. Change the color from here to here. Now what are we going to do? Maybe we can try the A string here. Look. So let's try from here. 
fingerboard. I just want to remind you of one thing, which is, I can imagine you playing this with orchestra in a big hall. So remember this, when you have a succession of, of notes that are the same, ba, 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 the audience in a big hall will not hear. They will not hear. They will hear. Okay. So, so you have to take care. So you have to articulate a little bit more when you have the same note as opposed to that doesn't matter, but because otherwise the audience will, I, I tell you, the bigger the hall and when a hall has reverberation, which you want, it all jumbles together and becomes, and they'll see your bow, but they won't hear any change. So just a, a little word of advice that you have. So we hit clearly. on this just a... first of all this b is a wolf mm -hmm. so you did this is too weak so i'm not a great fan of that bowing everything else i, I was very happy but let's try and then change the down bow you see to make an accent because after all it is supposedly a, a slur so and, and, sorry uh, I don't remember the notes so well so you teach me so let's do some, um So let's have good clarity and accents on those notes. Um, up, up at the end. No, because the B is a wolf, so you can't do much vibrato. Just play it. Don't, because you will get a wobble with the with the wolf tone. See? I don't care what you do because. Be 
careful. What I want to do is play that note and diminuendo. Okay, go ahead. Okay, okay, so uh, you, I, I think you should feel a little shame. Really, Shintaro? Really? For such a magnificent player as you? No. <laughs> First of all, this. I think let's try G string, right? Let's get that. So let's try from. There we go. Show me the right way to play it. better now this if you go to second position down bow to start the main body of the allegro on an up bow i think it's backwards just okay. opinion so let's try Second position. Down, but up, up, down, and up, down, and then you're you're ready to go. Go, watch me. I slurred it. So, and up, up, down. See what you think. Yeah, so that's an idea because the idea of start of doing that allegro, starting the, the main body of the allegro on the up, always seems to me a little bit, uh, a little weak. Okay. So, you know, then, uh, now the audience doesn't have any understanding of this rhythm, you know that. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. So we have to try to play it in such a way the audience understands it, right? So let's do from, uh, <laughs> now what, it's a triplet rhythm, right? <laughs> Well, let's make sure the audience understands that that's a rhythm that is triplet and you know understandable. If you ask these your colleagues here, they would have no idea what that rhythm is, not a single one. The only reason I know that is because I remember learning this piece 100 years ago. Galamian liked it because Heifetz played it. So go ahead from, uh, from there uh, on the A sharp. Go on, you got it. See, if you got this down bow, instead of, I couldn't believe we did that. <laughs> You're there. Now, up bow. I love that. <laughs> now, you know, you're, you're, they are broken octaves, aren't they? You play them. So let's play them broken. <laughs> let's give the composer a little credit here. Oh. 
you have a little habit. And such a strong player as you. You did this. You did this. You push. Okay? Sustain that, right? Sustain. Right? So play this octave. So can you slow the bow down on the down bow? <laughs> sustain. It's a slow bow and sustain that A. Go ahead. Sustain. We sing it. The F is more, the E is less. So think about that with your vibrato. I don't understand that. And then you went. <laughs> so let's not. Let's just stay there. Go ahead. Right there. I'm suspicious of the notes. Play these notes now, afterwards. Go on. All right, let's play those notes slowly, Shintaro, slowly, the triplets, slowly. Yep, keep going. Yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Is it an E? Or I don't remember, but I'm suspicious. Take a look. Okay. I didn't hear that. Okay. See, and that's a trouble when you play so well and so quickly, you tend to sometimes, you, not you especially, but anybody can lose those things. So, and I don't know why, why would I want to play that in the A string? Why? Play those notes uh, for me, would you? Okay. Is that what it is? Yeah? Okay, so second position is good too. It's two. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, so now you got this. Now what? 
What is it? Like that? Like that? One F sharp, F, F sharp? Yes. Okay, good. Just checking. <laughs> Go. I thought it was I thought it was a GG sharp. Um Actually, yes, you're correct. <laughs> oh my do you know how many years since I saw that music? Probably forty. It looks it looks like a sharp on that. Oh. Okay. 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 Okay, so it is. Okay, fine. Now you can go on. I'll stop bothering you. Now that you play the right notes. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. I think I'm going to have to call it now, even though I'd love to hear you more and hear the second melody, but you are really wonderful. In fact, the, all four of you are really wonderful. And I've been really pleased to, to hear you all playing at such a high level. So I just want to, to encourage you to have a great summer. Uh, love to hear you someday playing this with orchestra. That would be a big thrill because uh, you've, got, you've got a really nice, uh, lovely taste for this music. Play, you play with great conviction. And uh, in fact, all of you are, are playing just, just beautifully. It's been, a, it's been a real thrill to hear you. And I want to thank you, Cicely, for setting this, this class up. Oh, it, it's been an absolute pleasure. And yes, Shantara, that amazing playing. I hope we have, can we have just a few questions? I have one that came in no. that, I, that I'm dying to ask, actually. And it has to do with additions and in particular of this piece, because I know when I was looking for, I don't own it. So I had to look online to, to try to find a part for myself to, to look off of. And I found some kind of sketchy looking things on IMSLP. And then Shintaro sent me his part, which was a little bit different. And then I asked a friend and they said, oh, the piano part's completely different from the violin part. So with this piece in particular, is there a correct version. I, I don't believe that there is. Um, you know, now that you've mentioned it, I know, I remember when I did study it with Galamion, I mean, we're talking 19, I believe it was in the late 60s, you know, <laughs> so long ago. And I, I studied it a little bit. And I remember the part was a mess. And the notes were a mess. And the piano part was complete and total mess. And I, I don't have any magic formula. But I think that I owe a phone call to my dear Yuri Mazurkiewicz, uh, in Boston and to ask him about that. In, in addition, I'm doing a, um, a, a class for ARIA. Uh, and another, another violinist doing that class is uh, Ole, Ole Krisha. So between him, I haven't met him yet, but between Krisha and Mazurkiewicz, who's my friend at BU, I should be able to get some kind of information about that, but they're probably gonna shake their heads and say, yes, for some reason, this was like scribbled out in hand or some such thing. So the best thing is uh, that I can do is probably find out why it was that nobody ever did an authoritative, you know, version of this. I, I'm a, I'm a poor source of information when it comes to uh, this this uh, concerto. I'm just lucky that I vaguely remembered it because, of course, till this morning I had no idea that I was going to be uh, hearing it today. Well, vaguely remembering it would be putting it mildly for all of you listening you should know that uh peter does not have i don't think you have the corn gold or the no 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 so he's playing all of this from memory yeah but but they can all tell that because they're wrong notes and wrong bowings and you know no. it's not but anyway I'm, I'm there's a lot of useless information up here always adding more um and uh you know i gotta tell you just a uh, a little bit of a vignette uh, because I was uh, in a very peculiar life. 
uh, from an early age. Um, first of all, I was not a, by any means a, a gifted young player. I was not at all good as a, as a little kid. And my father was an excellent violinist. He was in the Boston Symphony, he was third chair. But um, he, he, had, they, he and my mother, they had two older children. I had two brothers and sisters who were quite a bit older. And now suddenly nine years later, they're presented with a kid who is singing all the time and not talking. And they didn't know what, what to do with this kid. You know, my father would be, you know, fooling around on the piano and, and I could, obviously I could sing at sight and I had, you know, various decent uh, pitch and, and some talented uh, little, little bits of talent that you hear in a little kid now and then. But my father had no idea about teaching a little uh, a beginner and teaching a beginner, ladies and gentlemen, that is, uh, there's a special place in heaven for people who teach beginners and do it well, okay? So they didn't know what to do. And my father was uh, complaining at Symphony Hall one day, what am I gonna do with this kid, you know? He's, I don't know what to do with the little five-year-old. And so a violinist in the orchestra who was curious uh, said, I'll do it, and I, 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 but you can't pay me because I, I've never done it before. And uh, that, that fellow who was curious to try the various methods that he'd seen and heard about, including Suzuki, and, but more uh, Samuel Gardner, a little bit of Flesh, a little bit of Dunas, that fellow was a, was a, a young violinist by the name of Joseph Silverstein. And Joe Silverstein, who was 26 years old, honestly, he was 26. He was already competing in the Queen Elizabeth of Belgium and the Levin Trade in New York, which at that time was the most prestigious American competition. Uh, he just was curious what it would be to start an absolute beginner, never seen a violin before or never played on one. So eight years, he struggled with me, scratching away um, and it got so bad that he just finally would take the violin and start playing just because he had to get the bad sounds out of his ear. But he did that for eight years, trying a little of this and a little of that. And I came out of the experience, he was very kind, but I came out of the experience of eight years with a bow arm that was like this and a left hand that was like this. And I played molto, uh, molto appassionato. Yes. And, you know, it sounded like that. So it was like that for eight years. And my mother would would see my father after BSO rehearsal. She'd say, George, Abby, it, it, it's terrible. Can you can you go and, and go and work with him? Because it doesn't look right. It doesn't sound right. It, it's not going well. And my dad would, then he would have to do the, the perp walk. What is the perp walk? That's the condemned man marching to the scaffold with his head down and shuffling his feet and he had to march to slow, very slowly walk to the back room where I was waiting for him. <laughs> and if he said, the sun is up, I would say, no, it's the moon. <laughs> so no matter what he said, I wasn't gonna agree with it. But that was the nature of my relationship with this poor dear man who was a wonderful teacher, but he didn't, he couldn't deal with it. So then he, he would, there would be a screaming fight. And then he'd go back to my mother and say, never again, I, I'm never going back there. <laughs> so this continued for about eight years until, well, Joe Silverstein became concert master of the orchestra in an audition in 1962. And my father was one of the people who was auditioning for the same job. Uh, but Joey was a strong, much stronger player and much younger. And uh, he got the job. And I, I mean, I, I always ask myself now, why did he do this? I mean, this was a hotshot violinist who was up and coming you know, he was in the section in Boston, but he was headed for the concertmaster job and everybody knew it. And so I asked myself, you know, why did he do this? He wasn't paid. He, he was just doing it. And with great regularity, you know, it was, it was, it was a, a hobby, but it was something that I, I really didn't understand. Um, and I finally, as, as time passed and I played concertos with him, including the Bartok second and and Brook G minor and Barnstein Serenade and and even chair music we played uh, uh, Prokofiev duo which I knew very well from my father and he didn't know so well um, played even his last concert where I was playing a, a Beethoven string trio and I was playing viola because he wanted me to play the viola with him and that was his last concert he died three weeks later um, 
unexpectedly. He did. He just had a major heart attack and uh, hit his head. But his curiosity, he was curious what it was like to do this thing. And therefore he was going to do it. Uh -huh. So I think for the lesson for all of us is curiosity is your greatest, your greatest thing. The greatest thing in your life is to be curious enough to go find out about things and not to be as afraid of something just because you don't know it. All right. And if we all followed this example of Joe Silverstein and Richard Bergen before him, who was also a concert master and always, you know, instead of shying away from something we don't know, instead, let's go after it. Let's try to find out about it. Failing is absolutely fine. But if you are curious, then you can, you have such, you can have a wonderful life in music is what I mean to say. And this is what Silverstein said to me. We were having lunch and it was turned out to be his last, last time he would, I would see him. And we didn't know that he was fine. He just said, I, I wanted people to know it because I asked him why he was doing this class at BU and at, and at Berkeley School uh, at B B Conservatory and why he was doing all this for nothing. And he said, I want people to know that it is possible in music to to have a wonderful life. You know, he's very he was very down to earth. He said, I have a wonderful car. I've got a great violin. I have a marvelous wife and I've got a nice swimming pool in my backyard. But he was kind of kidding because he but. The music for him was something he was always learning, always curious, became a very fine conductor, trained so many musicians to play with the knowledge of the score and not just play their part. Um, and so this is a, I was fortunate to have a few people like that in my life, Silverstein being one, uh, and then the great Felix Scalamir, Chandor Vegg was a great inspiration, um, and uh, Sasha Schneider, Absolutely. These are great, great people. Uh, I'll never forget uh, Paul Tortelier dancing around the room to show us how to dance in five, Ravel Trio. So, you know, and then of course, one of the absolute greatest inspirations was the, was, was Joseph Gingold. And Joseph Gingold was a student of Isai. So, you know, he would tell stories about Isai, who he, he, he had studied with. So, what the best thing that I can do, having heard these stories, is pass them on to you. I remember there was a violinist in the Boston Symphony. Uh, I was a kid, and he had studied also with Isai. And he showed me Isai's special fingering to the second page of the Brook G Minor Concerto. He had a very special fingering. You won't find this in any edition. Okay? So someday maybe I'll show it to you. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully we'll get to, to hear that another time. Thank you so much for, for the inspiration and for the connection to, to those people. And, and for my students who are on this Zoom call, if you don't know the names that you just heard, ask me or use our friend Google and you'll learn a lot. Um, I've talked a lot about Joseph Silverstein as well. He was a great uh, inspiration and influence on me. And um, so it's wonderful to hear, hear all of this. I think we should leave it there for the day. Thank you. Um, next week, I'm actually teaching. I'm, I get to get on in on the fun. So uh, we'll... can I get an invitation? Sorry? Can I get an invitation? You can have an invitation. Absolutely. Yeah. We'll have a guest host. Um, I will let you know who that is in the week ahead. Um, we're really close on funding the July classes. So that's terrific. I'm also really close to filling the July classes, but I'm keeping the applications open through the weekend. So if you want to play, send me a message, send me an email, and um, yeah, have a great week ahead. Cicely, thank you for arranging this, and thank you all for playing so beautifully today. Absolutely. So we'll see you next time. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for being thank here. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.